Today we're going to talk about modules, Java modules, the Java platform module system, and we're going to have some fun here. So because it's a, the presentation that the title says how I hacked Spring, Spring Boot, so it's not that mm, like recommended way to, of doing things, but there are use cases for this, of course. Uh, so my, my name is Igor. I'm a software developer. Here's the links to my online presence, my LinkedIn, so feel free to follow me over there. And uh, let's set some goals for today. So goal number one, we're going to create or transform a typical Spring Boot web application. And we're going to make it to use module pass instead of class pass, which is the default, which is like the only way, the only supported way. Uh, and uh, this will be done uh, like the right way, so that during development, like your ID, the compiler, the bundler, everything, it will use module pass instead of class pass. When we make a distribution out, offer up this distribution will also use module pass. So we're going to be using Gradle application plugin for this. And the second goal is to make uh, or again transform this application into a proper JLink image. And it's not just the GV, uh, GVM which has uh, uh, the modules which are required to run this app, but this thing will also, uh, will just like embed all the classes into the runtime image. We'll see that. Uh, so before we start, I wanted to do a quick poll, like how many of you used uh, Java modules in your projects? Raise your hand. How many people liked it? <coughs> Great. Okay. And how many people have how many people have run into issues because of the? the same. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, that was like back in 2017, almost six and a half years ago. Uh, and mainly there were two reasons. Well, the tooling was not ready to accept the change. Uh, like there were some Maven plugins which were in alpha or beta stage. There, there were some community made Gradle plugins. But mm, nowadays, it, like six years after, we have like first class support for modularity in Gradle, Maven has adapted to this and uh, the things which were using unsafe and other nasty tricks, they got updates and are now compatible with the module system. So technically, almost nothing prevents us from using modularity in your project. And uh, a little bit of uh, stats here. So this is courtesy of uh, Christian Stein, aka Sir Muras. Uh, so he pulled some information from Maven Central, so the top 1,000 most downloaded artifacts. Among them, 17.2% are real modules, meaning they, they have the proper like module info file and stable name and their APIs. 31% of them define at least the module name so that you can use them in your project and rely on. And everything else is, is not ready. So we can say like roughly 40% if we uh, not include bomb, bomb and other kinds of artifacts in our stats. Like roughly 40-ish 40, 40 percent of the ecosystem is module ready. And what do we do with the other 60? We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, so one may ask, why should they bother? Like why should they use module pass over class pass in their apps. And uh, the good explanation is in this sort of like a press release article from Oracle from six years ago. But the three key points which I think uh, in that, like the most important points is first to get reliable configuration. And what that means? It means that uh, the dependencies are checked not only at the compile type, but 
also at the runtime. So for example, if you ever run into no class def error, all of a sudden, like, like after a week of your app running in production, this, like using uh, module pass reduces the likelihood of things like that happening. Uh, the second thing is strong encapsulation. What does that mean? That means that we can first finally have private packages in our modules and we can define what we expect like what we export and what we export this to. Like you can export, for example, one package to a set of uh, friend, friend modules and uh, the rest uh, will be hidden. Or you can combine and export something to everyone and something more to just a limited sort of uh, wetted set of packages. Uh, and also, there are changes to when it comes to reflection. So reflection is, by default, not allowed in the modular world. Like, if you want somebody else to poke around your module, you have to be specific and you have to define this. And the third thing is improved performance. It's improved perf uh, why, why are we having this? Well, because of the stricter boundaries. For example, the GVM, uh, it will have more context and more uh, data uh, like about the interface implementations. They can like, at the start, uh, at the very beginning of the life cycle, know that hey, this class only exists in one module and uh, nowhere, nowhere else. And this mod like this package is not exported to anyone else, so it's effectively final. Uh, okay, so. Without any further ado, let's jump into the demo here. Uh, and uh, hopefully everyone can see uh, what I have on this screen. If not, raise your hand and I'll increase the font size. Uh, but we check that. OK, so yeah. bigger. OK, yeah, let's do this. OK, let's use 20. Oops, too much. Great. So we're gonna start. Um, and bef yeah, before we start, let me uh, tell you a few things about this repo. I'll share it after the talk. It's actually on my GitHub and uh, it's now public. But the idea is this: the idea is that this repo it contains a set of commits, and each commit has uh, like. A small, uh, like a short description and a lengthy description with the explanation of what's going on there. So if you want to know more, like why this particular step is important, go, like after presentation, you can check out the long descriptions of the commits. But I'll, I'll try to, of course, uh, tell you the most important things uh, during the presentation. So we're going to start with a typical uh, a Spring Boot web app, which I generated using um, the Spring Initializer. Uh, it's nothing fancy. I use Spring Boot 3.2.1. That was, I believe, the latest as of yesterday. Uh, but anyways, so we have two starters here, the JDBC starter, the web starter, and the uh, MySQL connector. So everything else is uh, yeah, what you would see if you generated it with uh, the Spring Initializer. Uh, and uh, in order for us to make it more uh, meaningful, let's add some uh, demonstration controller here, which will do like a typical thing. It will go and fetch some data from the database, create a record, and then this record uh, will be serialized to a piece of JSON and sent back over HTTP to the requesting party. Uh, so uh, here we have nothing. It's, again, a typical Spring Boot web app. Uh, and the step number one here, if we want to use module pass, we need to get rid of uh, the Spring Boot plugin because the, like the default bundling scheme, it generates a thing called nested jar. And this nested jar, it's like tightly coupled to the class pass. It doesn't work if you run it on module pass. 
uh, but we can uh, use an alternative bundling scheme, which is, by the way, a supported bundling scheme by Spring Boot. Uh, and that is uh, the Gradle application plugin. So all we have to do here, compared to the previous scheme, is to define the main class explicitly. And um, now, instead of generating a nested jar, this is not a, f not a fat jar, it's a nested jar. Uh, we'll, we'll just have a zip file with our dependencies and a couple of run scripts. So uh, let me run a distribution task here uh, and show you what it looks like now. Uh, so I hope yeah, if we go to the build folder and go to install folder, here we have our demo app, which has the two run script. This run script define the class pass. Here uh, and uh, we have uh, a bunch of uh, libraries, uh, and you can also trigger uh, or run the other distribution tasks uh, like uh, this zip, this star, which will generate an archive. Uh, and this plugin also contributes the run task, which you can use to run your app. And let's give it a shot and run it and see what what we have here. Uh, demo effect. Oops, no, I have the pre-configured thing which I have to use. And uh, if we look at the output, uh, our scene is up and running and we can test it. So for that, I have a little HTTP script which we can run and see that our app responds. So we fetch the database version, uh, we have some static text and we have the uh, vendor of the GBM which we use. Okay, so, but now we still use uh, class pass. Here, nothing changed. And if we inspect our scene with Visual VM, we can also see that uh, we're still, oops, sorry, the font size kind of messing everything up, but this is the long class pass string. Uh, all right, so let's try to go modular and start using modules. And uh, we use Gradle here. And all you have to do here is pretty much, if you want to start using modules in your project, you need to have a relatively up-to-date Gradle version, preferably 7.0 because with version 7.0, oh, this is the default. Like you can, all you have to do is you just create the module file in your source source folder here, uh, and that's enough for Gradle to start uh, using module pass instead of class pass in its uh, standard like compile uh, uh, or bundle bundling tasks. If you use Gradle 6.4 or like something between 6.4 and 7.0, you, you'll have to enable one, one more flag. So I, I included the explanation here in the uh, long commit message, but I hope everyone uses at least 7.0 in their projects. And that's pretty much it. So if we now run it, uh, we'll run into a bunch of issues. And these issues are expected. So here, the Java compiler, it now complains that in our source code, we use something from the module Spring, uh, Spring Boot, but we don't specify this dependency explicitly. And what we can do here, we can uh, use IntelliJ fix, auto fixes, and add uh, a module to our module descriptor, like this. This is about the tooling. So IntelliJ it has also first class module support now. Uh, okay, so let's add uh, all of our dependency to our module file. And it will look like this. So now if we try to run our app again, we should see it compiles, but it doesn't start. It doesn't start, now we have a different problem. 
So there are states that module main does not open package com example demo to module spring core, which is strong encapsulation. So spring like, heavily utilizes reflection, but here in the modular world, if something wants to access your module reflectively, you have to be specific ab about it. There are two ways. You can either make your module open, and then Spring will, uh, will, like Spring and anyone else is effectively will be able to poke around your module with reflection. Uh, but this sort of ruins the point. Uh, what we should usually do, we should usually uh, be explicit and uh, define who have access to our internals. So here I'm opening the only package that I have in this demo app uh, to the modules Spring Core and Spring Bins. And now let's try to run it and see if it still runs. Or sorry, not still runs, if we fix the issue. It doesn't run. Uh, well, we kind of fixed one issue and there, there are no more complaining about something not being opened to Spring, but now our app couldn't start because the dependency of our controller, the data source, is not it like could not be satisfied. And for those who work with Spring Boot, uh, they may recognize what the issue could be. Uh, the issue is that some other configuration which contributes this bin to our bin graph uh, was not uh, included and it was not triggered. Uh, so let's see where this data source uh, thing comes from. Uh, and uh, with the help of IntelliJ, we can see it comes from the Hikari data source auto configuration, which uh, has a condition on, on class Hikari, which comes from the Hikari module. And uh, well, now Spring cannot discover this uh, library in our class, well, sorry, module pass. And in order for it to make it discover, we need to specify again an explicit dependency here. So something like this. And one may think that, well, this looks a bit ugly because Hikari is an implementation detail here. Like, why should I bother? Like, I don't care. Like, I never specified Hikari to be used. This, this is what Spring gives me out of the box. And, but we'll get to that. For now, let's just specify this dependency explicitly in our module descriptor and see what happens. Uh, so I specified here. Let's give it another shot. And now, looks like our app started. So we can test it. Uh, well, another problem. Now it feels like nothing is listening on port 8080 which is probably related to another auto app configuration which was not triggered. And this time, uh, this is the Tomcat web server auto configuration, which was not triggered because the Tomcat library was not visible to Spring. So we can fix this by just adding another requires. Uh, and the same, let's run it and let's then test it. Okay, well, so yeah, go ahead. How did you realize that that's the problem? Uh, okay, the long explanation is in the commit message because uh, this talk, like, I only have one hour. <laughs> it, would not, it would not fit, but yeah, we, we, we can, like, I can describe it after the talk or you can just check the commit message. So now we have a different issue. The web server is running, that's good news. The bad news, it's a 500. So the app still doesn't work. And, uh, what the, the error here is pretty similar to what we saw earlier. Like module spring web cannot access class hello controller. Well, because our module does not open itself to the module spring web. And the fix is uh, straightforward. We need to uh, let uh, spring web module to Oops, the wrong file here. 
we need to let the Spring Web module to read our like module via reflection, and we'll also let Jackson do this because we're going to see the same error if we don't. Uh, so with this in place, let's let's restart our app again and uh, give it a test. Okay, great. Uh, it now works. So can we say that goal number one is accomplished? Uh, well, we'll get to that, but for now, let's look at our output here. And uh, so somebody who had to deal with Jarhel may recognize what's happening here. Like why we're seeing something gets logged to standard error, something gets logged to standard output. And if anybody get it, have some, some ideas, you can get a t-shirt. But if no one... <laughs> Yeah, these are the debug logs which I enabled. So, okay. they, yes, they are missing, but uh, like, for example, uh, I don't know, like task executor, it's fine because I'm not using any task executor here. This is just all the other configuration which Spring Boot has. Uh, so, that's not the same. Um, anyways, so the problem is that our Login bridge is not visible to Spring Boot again, and we have to uh, do the same thing here and define this uh, uh, login bridge as a dependency in our module. And now if we run our app again, hopefully we will no longer see this ugly login anymore. Yeah, looks like it's fixed. So the Tomcat uh, is now logging to the proper place. Uh, but going back to goal number one, let's see and make sure that our app is kind of fully modularized and use, uses only module paths and nothing more. So there are two ways of doing this. We can run the distribution task and uh, uh, see what our run script will look like, or we can use Visual VM. We'll, we'll actually do both. So if we look at our uh, run script, uh, for some reason, like everything but the MySQL connector ended up on the module pass, and this MySQL connector is still used, it's still being placed on the class pass. Uh, and if we check Visual VM here, I'm pretty sure we'll see the same thing, but just to demonstrate that Gradle kind of does care about these things when you develop your stuff and when you distribute your stuff, it, it's a, it is aware of module pass. Mm. So we have module pass here compared to what we had before. And uh, it's a very lengthy string. And if we go to system properties, we can spot class pass entry here. And this is the same MySQL connector. So what is like? What is wrong with it? Why why is it being placed on class pass while everything else is being placed on is being placed on module pass? Uh, well, there there are two things. So if we look closely at uh, the jar file, the MySQL uh, connector jar file, and uh, we can poke around it and see that there are no module info file, like the one we just created uh, in our project, or if we look at them, like for example, Jackson, too big, uh, that we can see that it has oops, uh, a module info file. Uh, but the MySQL connector, it doesn't have it. it, it, it there is no module descriptor in like the main, uh, place or and there are no module descriptor in the multi release jar places uh, and uh, if we look at other libraries that we have in our on our module pass for example the mic micrometer library uh, there's also no 
mm, module info dot class file here. However, this module defines uh, the automatic module name here. Uh, and uh, that's the difference. So uh, the MySQL connector, even though this is the very latest version, it's not like a version from six years ago. No, this is the most recent version. Uh, like Oracle people, they didn't bother to include neither module, like the module name, nor the module descriptor in it. And that's why Gradle, like, it thinks about this library as being not module pass compatible and places it on class pass. However, this is not the standard behavior. So if you were to use, for example, the Java compiler and craft the module pass uh, line yourself and place this thing there, it will work. Uh, there are some like rules uh, with regards to the module names, and uh, the Java tooling follows these rules, and it will like mm -hmm. generate you the module name which you can use uh, in your uh, module info files here, so you can like use it as it requires. Uh, but Gradle thinks this is a bad thing because, uh, well, if you want the answer, go to the long commit message, and uh, you you will have the answer. There, like. There is a link to the discussion on GitHub. I was one of the participants of this discussion, tried to convince that we should, like, there should be support for cases like that. And uh, there is, but we'll get to that. Mm, but unfortunately, it's not like the standard way. However, uh, like, if there is no standard way of doing something in Gradle, there usually is a plugin for this, right? And uh, that's the case here. So. Uh, what I uh, like about Gradle is it, its extensibility. Like if there is, like I just mentioned, no functionality out of the box, you can probably write your own plugin or use the existing one. And um, here, uh, one of the uh, Gradle core maintainers at the time, uh, they created a special plugin to handle cases like this. <coughs> and by handle, uh, what uh, by handle I mean what we can do here we can sort of take the situation in our own hands pretend that we are the maintainers of that library that is problematic and add the module information to it well in other words patch it and add the module descriptor to it and for this uh, there is this plugin called extra Java module info plugin exists, which does exactly what I just described. It allows you to patch your dependencies and retrospectively, retroactively add uh, module information. You can either add uh, an automatic module name entry to the manifest file, or you can create a fully, like a proper module info thing with the help of Gradle. And the beauty of uh, this plugin in particular, compared to other tools which do the same thing. Like for example, in Maven, Maven there is a plugin called Modetect, which allows you to do the same thing. You like it allows you to define a module descriptor for an existing library. Uh, but with Gradle, mm, the beauty is that uh, it utilizes the proper extension point, which is uh, called artifact transforms. Which, so this thing, it runs before your configuration is resolved so that all the downstream consumers of your li like of this library, they will see the patched version like it was from day one. And that means that your ID, your mm, tasks that use uh, module pass or class pass, they will see the patched module um, and it just works. Whereas if you were to patch something using Modetect uh, with Maven, like your ID will still think that this jar doesn't have the module information. In Gradle is not the case. So uh, enough talking, let's see how it works. Mm, and it works a very similar way. We ha have to define the name of the library that is being patched. Uh, sorry, the name, the coordinates, the may, uh, like the group ID and the artifact ID here. We have to give it a module name. And then we define like what this library requires and what this library exports. And there are more things which you can do, but you, 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 will, you will see this during um, the next few steps. So let's add this 
module information uh, in our build file. And one word of warning. So I have just one build file for this demonstration, but in real life, in real project, you should have a conventional plugin if you use Gradle, where you would put all these like common things that you apply to your project, like the uh, Java version that you use during compilation, this uh, modularity hacks. So they should all go to a conventional plugin. But for the simplicity's sake in desktop, we'll not be using a convention plugin here. Uh, so let's quickly have a look at our library now. And uh, if I refresh the configuration in my ID, now we can see that all of a sudden we have the module info class file added to our MySQL connector J. And now it's, it has the suffix module here. So it's a transformed artifact. But for your ID, for everyone else, it, it is just an artifact. And if we decompile it, we can see, well, pretty much what we saw in our, like the project, in our demo project. And we see the new module descriptor. So let's try to run the app again and see if it still works. Yeah, looks like it does, but we can never know until, unless we test it. Yeah, and it works. So if I run the distribution task uh, again, and we have a look at uh, the run scripts, we can see that class pass is gone. There's just module pass. And if uh, I go to Visual VM and do another inspection here, uh, okay. Class pass, no more class pass. So now we can technically say that goal number one is achieved. Our app uses solely module pass. Uh, it's fully functional, even though it's a very simple app. And if you have something bigger, you'll have to do more tuning, tweaking in terms of letting Spring to walk around more packages. But uh, yeah, it, it runs on module pass completely, even though we have this. Mm, library which is patched and uh, here I want to say a few more words of warning so this approach with patching it works perfectly for libraries which are not being actively maintained for example a library I know from 2004 uh, like its maintainers I don't know, they are retired they don't care anymore yet you need to use this kind of library in your project for some reason and the source code is not available anymore, this approach works perfectly because you once like, define this module in for configuration and then you're done. You don't have to worry about it anymore. With Spring, the situation is different because Spring is being actively maintained. And uh, when you do a trick like this, uh, well, you become another maintainer of Spring Framework. And with every new version, you have to you have to worry about things like that. You have to worry about new packages being added, packages removed, and so on. Uh, the good news is that I started working on this talk back in October 2023. And but uh, hold on, this is I'm g I'm, g I'm getting too, mm, too far from now. So because uh, as you may already guessed, we'll have to do more patching here, and uh, I I'll explain why this is kind of the danger zone. So the goal number two for today is to build a JLink image. And be before we start with uh, hacking, let's uh, quickly <coughs> look at what JLink uh, is. Anybody here use JLink? Uh, no. OK. So you should use it like if you even if you like bundle your app as a Docker um, image, you can still build like a reduced uh, minimal version of the GVM, which will only contain things that your app needs. You don't even have to use uh, module pass modularity here. You can just tell JLink, hey, I want a GVM with uh, these specific modules, which required for my app. And you will have a, a much smaller distribution. Uh, so other benefits of JLink, it allows you to 
strip unused modules from your GDK. It allows you to strip debug information from your classes, generates a CDS archive, uh, fill the resources, and many other things. So it essentially allows you to tune the GVM for the specific, specific needs of your particular app. And by that, reduce its size and reduce the footprint and uh, make it more secure in terms of there is less code in it. Oops, sorry, uh, wrong slide. So now when we kind of know what JLink is, uh, let's try to add it to our project. And uh, unfortunately, Gradle has, like while Gradle has the first class modularity support, like all the standard tasks, they uh, do use modules when your, uh, like your modules have the module descriptor, the module info file. Um, it doesn't have any built-in support for the extra tools like JLink, JPackage, JDEPS, and so on. So, uh, however, Gradle is very extensible, so we can do this with the help of the plugin. And I have had a need uh, at my previous uh, company I worked for to use JLink within Gradle. I tried to find the existing plugins, there were none, so I, write, I wrote my own. And this plugin is nothing more than a simple tiny wrapper around the JLink tool. It doesn't do any nasty things like this plugin, which we just added, the extra module plugin, which does patch uh, your jars. No, this is just a synth wrapper. And uh, let's try to use it in our project and see what this plugin does. So if I refresh my configuration, and if we look at the tasks that are now in our Gradle task ref, there are three more new that three more tasks which were just added. The first task is image run. So it allows you to run the JLink image, uh, which was built by the task called image. And the third task is um, image modules. So this task allows you to list the modules which ended up in your JLink image. And uh, this plugin sort of uses the, con the already existing conventions. So it, if you apply it to your Gradle project, which has uh, an application plugin applied, it will inherit the main class name and main module from uh, the application extension and uh, it will inherit your module path from your dependencies. So, okay, let's try to run the image run task here, which should, oops, uh, which should generate the JLink image using our class path and our, uh, like, the, our module information that we defined here and see how it works. Or, oops. So even though I triggered the image run task, uh, but since this image run task has a dependency on the image task, the image task was triggered, fir triggered fir first here, uh, but it aired out. Uh, and uh, this time, oops, uh, the error is that it, the error says automatic module cannot be used with JLink. Spring Web MVC. So, yeah, if we look at any Spring family jars, we can see that, yes, they are kind of support mo modularity, but they are automatic modules. They uh, don't have the proper uh, Java module descriptor in them. And this is, like, if you want to use JLink, it's, it's not possible. Everything, uh, on your module path has to be a real module. And what we can do here, well, we can technically apply the same technique and define, define the proper module info file ourselves, like be pretend that we're the maintainers of this library. Uh, and to continue my argument um, or, or my point about uh, using patching here, so in case of using Spring or any other library which is being actively maintained, well, you have to realize that from now on, you will have to maintain this thing. But for the sake of demonstration, uh, let's try to do this. 
<coughs> so now it complains about the Spring WebMVC module being an automatic module. Uh, but I guess there are, there are more. And uh, there is how can we know like, the amount of work, the, uh, the number of modules which are automatic modules? Uh, well, we can use the setting on the extra Java module info extension here to fail on automatic modules. So if we enable this and run our build task again, we'll see a different error, but it essentially says uh, the same. Like there is an automatic module and if we count how many in total we have here, well, there are 20. And uh, this is a big problem, like defining 20 module descriptors like we did here probably is going to be very boring and cumbersome task to do. But what if there was a better way? Like, could we use some, um, some technology to help to solve this problem? And the answer is yes. There is technology, and this technology is built into JDK. It was there since the release of, I believe, Java 8, but it was not doing this exactly same. And uh, this technology is called JDEPS. So that it allows you to analyze the bytecode of your jar files and figure out uh, the dependencies. So let, let me quickly show you a demonstration. So we're going to be using this uh, MySQL connector as the um, playground. So if we craft uh, this command uh, here, jdeps, like ignore missing depths, generate module info in this folder and use this jar, like read this jar. And if we run it now, uh, what we can see here, we see a module info file was created and this module info file has the module information uh, that was extracted from the bytecode uh, of the MySQL connector. Even though this thing has uh, quite a lot of exports, uh, requires, and all of that here in our build file, it looks mm, like simpler, right? Because that, that's enough for the standard use case to work. We didn't bother about everything else. Uh, so we have this tool. We have uh, 20 uh, dependencies which we need to modularize. What we can do, and the syntax is different. So the JDEPS tool, it generates uh, you a real like module info Java file, which can be compiled with Java compiler. But uh, the Gradle extra Java module plugin, it uses its own DSL to define this information. Uh, well, the good, the good news here is that um, um, the extra Java module info plugin it has um, the task which it can contributes uh, when you add it to your project, which is called module descriptor recommendation. So if we run this task under the hood, it will use um, JDEPS and a couple of other tools. And it will also extract the information from the dependency, like metadata. <coughs> Sorry. But the output, it will give you like a good starting point, a template, what you can just copy and paste to your build file. And uh, it will essentially be the transformed version of this. So let's try doing this. I'm not going to be copying it because it, it takes time even to select it here. And this is to the point that, yeah, think twice. When you do things like that, think twice. When you patch something, think twice. Uh, but I have a commit with this, mm, and uh, now our module file, oh sorry, our, our build file looks a bit uglier because it is, how many lines? Uh, 744 lines. Not, not good, right? But <laughs> if you don't have 20 depend dependencies which has to be patched, it could be, it could be okay, it could be like 20 lines. 
Uh, all right, uh, enough talking. Let's see if this thing runs. And well, it doesn't. No surprise here. It doesn't run because it says, hey, module Spring Web does not read module that exports reactor blockhound integration. Like, what the hell? What's going on here? So if we refresh our configuration so that we can see the patched uh, dependencies in here. OK. And if we find the web module and open it, oops, we can see that besides uh, the exports requires, there is this thing called provides like the one more directive which does something. So what does it do exactly? Well, it's nothing more than um, the declaration of the Java service loader provider. Uh, sorry, Java service loader provider and the implementation. So in the class pass world, uh, what you would do if you have a service provider, you would need to create a s file, which is the name of this file is the name of the interface. And uh, inside of it, you will see the implementation. And here, IntelliJ complains that, hey, the implementation is not found. And if we uh, open the implementation, sorry, the, the interface is not found. If we open the implementation class, yes, the interface is not here. And this was tolerable in the class pass world, where you could have uh, like an optional implementation of something. In the uh, modular world, if you have something in your module info file, it has to be uh, on the module pass. So this is about the reliable configuration. Uh, OK, since we are not using any reactive stuff, thank God, in our project, uh, we, we can safely avoid this thing here. Uh, so and in for us, in order to do this, mm, what we have to do is just define some ignores. Like besides these exports and requires, we can ignore a particular service provider. There are three of them in this 20, among the 20 libraries. And one of them is the reactor blockhound, which we will ignore. And now if we uh, check out this revision we already did and refresh uh, refresh our thing. Uh, this uh, provides is not here anymore. This one is a, le a legit provides because it contributes Spring Servlet Container Initializer, which we have, and it's it should work. Okay, uh, let's give it another shot. Let's see if it runs. <laughs> Well, it doesn't. But now it's a different issue. And the issue says that <laughs> module auto configure, Spring Boot auto configure does not open itself uh, like to module Spring Core. Well, wh why? Because even though the bytecode analysis is a very powerful tool, it cannot detect reflection. And this is the instance of reflection within the Spring, uh, spring modules. Uh, well, what we can we do here? Here we need to, again, refine these module descriptors that we just defined. And there are two ways. We can either make the module open, like let everyone use, uh, use it using reflection, or we can be granular and just specify, uh, oops, hold on. Yeah, we can be granular and just specify that, for example, this package, Spring Framework Web Server Handler, has to be open to Spring Core. And this will be applicable, applied to the Spring Web MVC module. Uh, OK, let's do this. Uh, and let's try to run our app again. Yeah, it, it, it starts. Uh, let's give it a quick test. Uh, here, and it even works. So technically, we have uh, this thing, which is uh, now using uh, the 
properly modularized dependencies, and it should be compatible with JLink. There are no more automatic modules. Let, let's see if this is true. So I'm running the image run task again. I'm going to stop the app here. Uh, well, and now the problem is like another, another day, another problem. Uh, now it seems like there's a problem with not the module we, we just patched, but with the module which was supported or which was supplied by the maintainers of a library. And in, in this case, the um, maintainers of the Apache Tomcat uh, library. So it says that packages that are exported do not exist in the jar. Well, why this is happening? Because um, many libraries out there which support modules, they don't have the proper module info Java file. They generate this uh, module info class using uh, ASM or any other bytecode tool. And this tool doesn't verify like the presence of uh, the, pack, uh, the package in the module. So there's a problem with the metadata. And uh, there is a PR, op well, merged PR to, that fixes this. Uh, but the new version of Tomcat has not yet been released. So for now, what can we do? We can patch another thing here. OK, we patched it. And uh, I will not be running it, because we will run into a similar problem with um, log4j thing. Even though they claim that they are kind of module ready and they have proper modularization, this library, well, not yet. It doesn't work with Jalen because um, here's a little, bit a little bit different story. Uh, the bytecode they generate, it uses a special like instruction called package. It's not exports. And they forgot to include one more package which exists in their jar, which is uh, a, like if we quickly go here, uh, let me see. Uh, because this package is located in the multi-release folder. It was not included in this module. So craziness. Anyways, how do we fix this? Well, we can just patch it. And um, hopefully, the maintainers will fix this. And we don't need to do this anymore. OK, with everything patched, let's try to see if we uh, can now finally build the GA link image. I'm running the image run task again. Uh, it works. And it's even finished. So the image was built. That's great. Still, our app doesn't work here. It complains about um, the driver. It says uh, failed to load uh, the MySQL driver class. But let's hold, uh, hold on and look at what the image looks like. So if we go to the images folder here, uh, we can see that um, there is a, like a typical JDK layout. And uh, there is a re release file. And th this release file contains uh, a list of the modules that are present in this particular JDK. And we can see the same, uh, but in a, like, in a better formatted way if we run the image modules task. Uh, so yeah, these are all the modules which ended up in our image. And there is no, if we look at it, there is no MySQL. Uh, uh, connector here. Why this is happening? Uh, well, this is not an error, and I think this is more like by design. Our MySQL connector is a runtime only dependency, meaning it's not being referenced anywhere in our source code. Uh, so we need to tell JLink that, hey, besides the our, our, our class, or sorry, our module and its dependencies, you'll el also have to include uh, the con MySQL connector module in the image. And this can be done uh, by configuring the plugin to account for this additional uh, module. So we explicitly tell JLink, this is the argument name for JLink, to include this MySQL connector module in uh, the module graph. OK, let's uh, run, or yeah, let's run this thing again. Uh, it finally works. 
but we can never be sure unless we test it. And we have a 404. <laughs> Yikes. OK, why this is happening? Uh, the long explanation is in the commit message. But the short explanation is that the component scan doesn't work. And I think this is actually good because, well, using component scan in a big project, in my experience, led to many bad things. You should be just specific and like define your bins explicitly and not rely on the scanning because accidentally things which you don't want to be included could be included. Um, and uh, what we can do here, we can just disable component scan. And this is happening because the way how Spring, like this particular class which is mentioned here, scans the jars because there are no, no jars anymore. But anyways, so if you want to know the details, check out the commit message. Uh, for now, we're just going to disable <coughs> the component scan, rebuild our image again. Our it runs, and it finally works. So we can see here uh, we have uh, the our API endpoint response with the message which we saw originally. Great. Uh, can we do better here? Yeah. What we can do here, we can first uh, configure JLink to uh, like not include things which we don't care about. If this is our app, we are not planning to do any sort of uh, compilation against these native libraries. We can uh, tell JLink to not include header files, like this uh, include folder. Uh, and there are many more JLink settings that uh, you can specify here. Uh, they are all like explained uh, in the plugins readme if you ever want to use it. Uh, OK, but now the question is, can we distribute this uh, JLink image now? And the answer is no, because we don't know which JDK was used to build this JLink image from. Well, it used the system JDK, which I have configured in my ID. But God knows which version that is, except the major version, of course. And uh, the vendor, anything like that. So preferably, if you build an image, like with Docker, you specify like your base image, it's either like Debian or Ubuntu or whatever. Here's the same. Like if you plan to distribute a JLink image, you need to be specific. And for this, the plugin, the JLink Gradle plugin, it supports uh, <coughs> defining custom JDKs. And this is, by the way, the functionality of JLink. The plugin only like wraps around it into a nice and easy way to use. Uh, so we need to do two things. The first thing we need to define uh, from where we want to fetch our uh, GDK base images from. Like, uh, and for this demonstration, I'll be using Azul. And uh, now in our build file, we need to specify the flavors. Like I will be building the image for Windows, Mac OS, the Intel Mac OS, the ARM Mac OS, and Linux. <coughs> so we specify all of that. And if we run the assemble task uh, here, or you can run, uh, hold on, let me show you what it, it looks like uh, in terms of the tasks. So here we have like three more or four more additional Gradle tasks. And if we run assemble task here, <coughs> uh, it will build um, the images for all the distributions that we specify. So under the hood, the plugin will download the GDK for you, cache it, uh, supply it to the J link, and uh, eventually you will get the same. Eventually you will, you will get the target uh, build. Uh, so not only that, like I was using uh, Azul here. But you can, you can use anything you want. You can use uh, OpenG9 here, for example. And all you have to do is to specify, uh, sorry, another repo, like from where you want these binaries to be fetched from. Uh, and then you need to specify another target here, which will be, in my case, uh, this. So if I run uh, this task again, not again, but just run this task. 
uh, now the resulting image will be based of the IBM's JDK. And uh, okay, it's building it. Takes some time. Okay, it's done. We can run this image here. Uh, okay, it even works. Uh, and if I run our test, we can see that the Java vendor is IBM Corporation. Uh, so yeah, it works both with the hotspot JDKs and if you use IBM, you can also use, uh, use it as a target. Okay, so the last thing here is to more of why should I bother? Why should I like use modules in my system instead of class pass? Uh, well, I'm gonna run the same app again, but this time there will be like two instances. One instance will be run on port uh, 8080, the module version, and uh, the class pass version will be run on port 9090. And for some reason, like l let's say we have an RC in our code. Like somebody exposed uh, sp the Spring Expression language parser over HTTP, and we have this big problem. So let's see what happens um, if I try to exploit it. And for the sake of demonstration, we have a super secret service in our project, which no one can use except us. And if I run um, this code which instantiates this service and involves the method, uh, well, it happily gives us the secret. So this is class pass. But if I run the same thing but with module pass, uh, okay, hold on, I need to restart. Uh, this thing is not needed anymore because it doesn't have the secret service. Mm. Okay, we run and let's run our test again. We have an exception and this exception sta states exactly what it should, that uh, module spring <laughs> expressions cannot access class secret service because nobody let it do, uh, do this. Uh, so this is how you can benefit from strong encapsulation in your projects. Uh, okay. I want to give some credit, uh, and credit goes to Yandrik Johannes. Uh, this is the former member of the Gradle core team, the guy who implemented this modularity support in Gradle. And he's also the maintainer of the extra Java module info plugin, which we saw today. Uh, so kudos, Yandrik. Uh, he has a very informative and beautiful YouTube channel. If you want to learn more how to maintain proper idiomatic Gradle builds, check it out. And his GitHub is full of examples and sample projects uh, when it comes to Gradle. Uh, so to wrap up, uh, never ever distribute, uh, like if you want, if you're maintaining a library and you need a modular dependency, make sure this dependency either has the automatic module name or the module descriptor file. Don't try to patch your dependencies and distribute your library. This is a wrong idea because, well, patching only works at your local machine, in your project, nowhere else. Of course, if you have time and the ability, try to just contribute the module info descriptor which you came up with to this project. Open a pull request. Uh, it should be easy. Like even though like there are projects that still use Java 8, there are ways how you can generate this module info class file using a like a build plugin. Like Modetect supports this. Uh, there are plugins for Gradle and so on. And yeah, Spring Boot was chosen for demonstration purposes only. Probably in real life, it's not a good idea to use this technique because, like I mentioned, Spring ecosystem is being actively maintained, and um, yeah, uh, you you will have to make changes as Spring maintainers cha change their code. The good news is that uh, I started doing uh, working on this talk when there was Spring 3.1 that was the release. And with Spring 3.2, I actually removed uh, 
couple of uh, patches. Like more and more libraries become proper modules. So hopefully at some point we will not need um, this anymore. Uh, yeah, these are the links. Uh, so this, the, the very last link is the, the project which I was showing you. The other two is the plugins which were used in this project. Uh, that's it, that's all I wanted to share today. would you suggest would start actually using modules in this case? And which ones should maybe shy away from this? Oh, well, mm, uh, I'd say you should try with your apps. And if you don't use like libraries which use reflect reflection a lot, you should be good. Like ideally, there are no reflection. But even though if you do have libraries which need reflective access to your code, it's totally OK to define these granular opens and let these and only these libraries to poke around your code. I noticed we didn't have tests here. Most of the libraries that we have reflection being used are in tests. Yeah, testing is a big topic. And I wouldn't fit it in one hour for sure. It will take two hours. But uh, this guy, yeah. so his YouTube channel has some ideas how you can either black box your module, okay. which is essentially very simple. If, if you black box things, you test public APIs. You don't need to use a reflection. Uh, but if you need to do white box testing, there are ways how you can in test patch your modules and let these libraries to poke around it. While in production, for example, I know if you use um, like Makito or something like that, there are ways to make it work with Makito without sacrificing encapsulation. Igor, you had the question. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask. So you show us uh, Gradle. Uh, it was Gradle task for different distribution. Yeah. And is it was it just written by you, or it was generated based on JLink configuration? Yes. Uh, so as long as you provide uh, the targets here, uh, so these JLink images, so each target will create a new task. No. So this task like will build the image for Linux x64 with the IBM's flavor of the JDK and so on. So like, yeah, it kind of contributes the task dynamically. Uh, by the way, the these two plugins, they are open source. They are Apache 2.0 license. So feel free to use them. Feel free to look at their code. And they are like pretty straightforward in terms of the implementation. Any other questions? Okay, I think we're good. Thank you very much for coming today.